Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling on the American Battle Monuments Commission. Each cemetery has a wall and they have missing in action. When a missing of action is found, and in fact, we had one two weeks ago from World War II, they put a rosette next to the individual's name uh, on that wall of the missing. One of the things we always have to remember is separate the war from the warriors. There's all kinds of politics and decision-making that goes into sending America's youth to war, but that should not detract at all from those who give their lives for their country and being asked to do what they do. You know, I tell you every day, if you think you can be surprised by anything as an old 50 or 60 year old general, you would be surprised at all the new surprises you get. Mark, thank you for joining me for this conversation. David, it is a pleasure to be with you. I've long admired your work and uh, we've never really talked one-on-one other than being on both sides of the camera at CNN, but it's it's fun to be with you in person. Well, there's a lot of catching up to do then because there, there are a lot of things that I've wanted to ask about some of your experiences and some of your mindset that you bring into those insights where you're a, a military analyst on CNN and especially in the last year and a few days now yeah. with the war going on in Ukraine. And clearly based on a whole lot of experience and thinking that we don't get to dig into. Here's the chance to get to dig into that, but really towards a mind of an important anniversary that's coming up that you're a, a special part of involving American battle monuments and, and cemeteries. So I do want to reserve a lot of time for that. Sure. But before we get there, you, you spent most of your career um, inside the, the United States Armed Services. And I want to figure out why, because you grew up, if I recall, it was in Missouri somewhere next door right. to Illinois. So as we always referred to it, the state of misery next to us. <laughs> but you decided to go to West Point. And, yeah. and I don't know why. What, what were you thinking when you were teenage Mark Hurtling? Well, truthfully, a couple of, of those first few days at West Point, I said to myself, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> really, David, the, the reason was because I came from a lower income family. Uh, I had a brother and a sister who were both older and they had scraped and saved a little bit. And my parents had helped them out to go to college. And uh, there was not a whole lot of money left for me, but I had a great guidance counselor at the high school I went to who said, hey, you know, you seem to have Hmm. uh, the potential for uh, going to West Point. Hmm. Now, remember this was 1971, which tells you how old I was. And there was not that many people going to West Point during those latter days of the Vietnam War. The the military was not a career that you wanted to choose. So back then, truthfully, it was uh, not as difficult to get in. Mm -hmm. My grades were not great. They were okay. But I got an appointment and a nomination to the academy and and went there. and, And the interesting thing about that is I will share with you, I had never left the city of St. Louis, had never been on an airplane, before I flew to New York all by myself and uh, took a bus up the Hudson River to the military academy in upstate New York. Yeah. Uh, and from the very first day, whereas it was a really rough experience, mm-hmm. it was different in the arena that I really enjoyed. Uh, some of the challenges, there was always the pushing to do things that you never thought you could do mm-hmm. uh, in both the military and the academic and the athletic realm. And I just fell in love with the place from the very first moment, even even though it was extremely challenging. What was what was the bigger challenge for you? The being pushed physically in ways you probably had not been before or being pushed mentally in ways that perhaps you hadn't prepared yourself for? Yeah. You know, most people don't know this, but the cadets, the new cadets arrive for basic training on the first of July, a couple of months before the academic year starts. So the entire summer is sort of like boot camp. Uh, You are pushed to the limit. You're trained on new things. It's very different than having a drill sergeant because it's upperclassmen who are the first time testing their ability to lead and and drive their team back then. It's it's a I think it's a much more positive environment, uh, thankfully, now than it was when I was a cadet. But the first two months 
you know, it was road marches and rifle ranges and, you know, combat uh, uh, you know, bayonet drills, sleeping out in the woods, things like that. But then it went into the academic year. The, the summer was tough, but I felt like I was meeting the challenges. Truthfully, David, the academic year was, was my downfall. Uh, I had a social science background in the high school I was in. It was a Catholic high school, all boys high school in St. Louis. And uh, not as much attention on math and sciences as we should have had. And that is the focus at West Point when you're talking yeah. about a school that at the time gave an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. So my first two years were just hell on earth, uh, mm -hmm. studying hard, doing the military stuff. I was a swimmer and water polo player. So that took me away from the academics and put a little bit more demands on the day, but it was challenging. Um, what was the academic culture of that time? You, you obviously with the, the water polo and the swimming and presumably doing well on some of the history and military tactics classes, Yeah. but the math and science mattered and it mattered a lot. Was it basically, Hey, could that tough, tough it through, just work it out. Or did, was there some kind of mentoring, coaching, some help to get you over that line? Yeah, the classes at the military academy are, are limited to 15 students. And, you know, there, back then there was an expression, you are graded in every class every day. So you had a military professor, and I went back later on to teach at the academy. Uh, but, you know, the, the math teachers, the science teachers were all usually captains or majors, most of whom who had just come from Vietnam. So here's where these battle-hardened infantrymen who were trying to teach young cadets math, and uh, they did a pretty good job, not only in terms of the teaching, but also the mentoring. You could go to what we used to call additional instruction anytime you wanted, if you were failing a subject or having trouble in a subject, uh, to be mentored by your instructor. And they were pretty good about it because unlike a normal college, this was their full-time job, and they were soldiers used to working 24 yep. seven. So yep. it, there was a whole lot more emphasis on the individual development of the cadets, which there still is today. And by the way, those instructors, when you're on, when you're on an assignment to the military academy as, a, as an instructor or a professor or a P as we called it, uh, you're there three years and that's it. And then you go back to the army. So it, it is really uh, a, a nice break in assignments to be an instructor at West Point as a young captain or a major. Uh, but they also know that, that the future is who they're teaching. The young cadets in the classrooms are going to be the ones that are becoming along to their units in the future as lieutenants. So they better be smart and fit and active and emotionally and physically sane. Yeah. I don't think it's universal among people who one way or another go into teaching. But I know from my experience and speaking with many others who have taught that it is very common that there's something at some level that a teacher did that, first of all, and you hope for this, that, that first of all, drove you to succeed, that, that they found a way to get through to you and, and take you in a positive direction. But there's almost always one that you didn't like something they did or the way they taught, the way they interacted with students. And when you become a teacher, you say, well, I'm never going to do that. Did you have both of those experiences? Because yeah. you ended up teaching. Um, <laughs> did, did you have some role models as teachers that you knew I wanted, I wanted to be like him or her? And then did you have something happen in school at West Point and you said, well, if I'm ever in that position, I'm, I'm going to do a lot of things, but I ain't going to do that. Yeah, uh, definitely. In fact, I was talking about this just the other day. Uh, I had an instructor. I was failing uh, electrical engineering as a sophomore, uh, a really tough course. I was having trouble with it. I just couldn't get the concept. Went to the initial instruction as best I could with the swimming dynamics and water polo. Um, and I was failing going into the final exam and knew that if I failed it, I would either be asked to go to summer school, which is horrible, uh, or at West Point, because it's the one month you have on leave, uh, you would give that up to go to summer school or potentially even get kicked. kicked out. Yeah. Uh, and this instructor told me the, the night before the term end examination, he said, Cadet Hurtling, you, you are not going to pass this exam and you don't really belong here at West Point. You, you don't have the qualities of a soldier because I was failing on an electrical engineering uh, course. 
So yeah, that sort of fired me up a little bit. And uh, I hope you've since then sent him a photo of your three stars. I mean, that I would have be not, appropriate. But, but I still remember his name. I certainly won't say it. But it was interesting because on the other side of that, there were captains and majors who really lit my fire. And I'm going to comment on that for a second, because as I teach leadership now, uh, and when I was a soldier commanding units, we all would have to, we'd always have the uh, performance evaluation once a year of our subordinates. And we'd always kind of, they'd fill out what they did and what they think they wanted to achieve and how they did it. But I would always ask them for a one piece, a one page piece of paper, single space typewritten of who lit your fire in your life. And I, I started focusing on the type of people that lit individuals fire. And what you just said a minute ago is right on track. There are 50% of the people will say my mother, my father, my uncle, Jim, my brother lit my fire, a coach in high school, but about 50% would say it was a teacher in some level of schooling. Mm -hmm. And they would explain what that teacher did. And in the majority of the cases, it wasn't because the teacher was nice or taught them something they didn't know. The majority of those cases where a teacher was named, it was because the teacher was tough and held me to standards and, and helped me do things I never thought I was capable of doing, which I, that's a leadership lesson in and of, it, of itself, I think. Yeah. And it, certainly in my case, you know, I had a couple of teachers early on who drove me to be interested in and at least decent at things that I didn't think I was interested in and I didn't think I could do well at, and then motivated me to be even better. And right. that's, that's leadership in any context, but as a teacher, you're, you're changing someone's life right. by doing that. Right. Well, and there's a similarity between teachers and soldiers, you know, who are leaders because you're protecting lives as a soldier. You're protecting your soldier's life if you're in charge and you're teaching them to, uh, you know, exist on a battlefield and come home alive to their family. So there is that level of caring that's required in any kind of military leader, just like there is in a teacher changing the lives of a, of a young student. We won't walk through every step in your long and storied uh, <laughs> military career, but you did spend, I would say, most of your time in, in Europe or in, in the United States. Um, a nice combination of things, you know, tank and scouting versus training, uh, operations planning here. Um, kind of a, a good wide experience in the first couple of decades of that career. Um, and in that career, you ended up, I think the first, I don't know what you'd call it, live action that you had was in the, the Gulf War, correct? Right. Desert Storm, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you willing to talk about that and the battle that your cavalry unit was in that, that led to your injury? Yeah, we, um, this was 1991, obviously, February, and I remember the date, February 27th at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, I was a, what's called a cavalry squadron S3 operations officer for a cavalry squadron of about 800 soldiers. We were at the time formed as an air ground squadron, which meant we had two uh, companies or troops, as we called them, of, of Bradley fighting vehicles and two troops of uh, Cobra and Scout helicopters. So it was an air ground organization that was uh, given the mission of an advance guard of the 1st Armored Division, which meant we were about 10 kilometers in front of the 1st the Armored Division in the attack and over a span of about 20 kilometers uh, and looking for the enemy. Back then, there was not the kind of intelligence gathering features that we have today to determine where the enemy is, and then yeah. that would drive the operations. Yeah. And in fact, I'll share with you this, uh, David, because of your background, uh, we did not even have GPS uh, on our vehicles going through this vast desert with no trees, no road markings, no... Uh, geographical boundaries where you could tell where you were. So before the war, uh, we kind of jerry-rigged this uh, combination of boat compasses and Loran, uh, the old Loran seafaring systems that a lot of fishing boats use now to guide us through this ocean of sand that we were going through. Uh, not many people had GPS during those mm -hmm. days. So it was really kind of a 
adaptation of a cavalry unit to determine how to fight. And when we had our first engagement with a um, with an Iraqi unit, not a Republican Guard unit, we were interrogating one of the 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 colonels that was in this Iraqi unit, and he said, "How did you guys get out here? Uh, we always get lost when we drive around the desert, like you're doing." So it was just that adaptation. Yeah. Uh, our cavalry squadron was part of uh, a, a battle called the Battle of Medina Ridge. And there were a couple of big battles, the Battle of Norfolk, the Battle of the 73 Easting. Medina Ridge was the one where we were involved, where uh, we found a couple of Republican Guard units, uh, did what's called a passage of lines, where we handed them over to the tank units that were behind us. And in a span of about 12 to 14 hours, both of those Republican Guard divisions allegedly the key to Saddam Hussein's military, his palace guards yep. were destroyed uh, with very few injuries. And as I remember, zero uh, casualties from the U.S. side. Yeah, but but you you did take some, right? <laughs> we did. We had a at the very beginning of the fight, uh, right as we were turning over the fight to the armored brigade that was behind us, we were hit with uh, five rounds of cluster munitions. Uh, right. right where we were coordinating yeah. off the, we were off the Bradleys actually coordinating the passage when these rounds hit overhead uh, or they exploded overhead. We didn't know what it was. All we heard, it was one o'clock, like I said, one o'clock in the morning about it had been raining and we heard uh, five large pops. And what that was, was the round opening up and delivering these cluster munitions on top of us. Uh, our cavalry squadron, I think, sustained 33 injured, mm -hmm. no dead, uh, thankfully. And I happen to be one of them that took a piece of shrapnel on my leg. So, yeah, I was injured during that artillery strike. But it was not not at the level where you needed to be um, taken out of the picture. You no. were still able to, to continue. No. Right. In fact, I had a an operation. I had a bike accident a couple of months ago and uh, was brought into surgery or in the emergency room. And as they did the x-ray, the doctor came in and said, hey, you've got a couple broken bones from this accident, but uh, there's a couple of pieces of metal inside your leg too. And it was <laughs> the remaining shrapnel from over 30 years ago. Yeah. Were, were you aware it was there? Did you have, ever have a metal detector? I trigger? was not aware of it. I remember it going in there and I remember the the corpsman at the time saying, don't worry about it. We're not going to try and pull it out, but yeah. uh, it'll be there. Yeah. It'll finally work its way out someday. And it never did. <laughs> well, I'm glad it wasn't. Wasn't more than that. That's yeah. for sure. And there wasn't, it wasn't the last time that you were in, I assume that took place. If I recall, that was, was that in Iraqi territory? Or was that in Kuwait? It was, it was in Iraq. So yeah, yeah you were in Iraq. Didn't go back for a while. Uh, it wasn't the kind of place you just, you just went to until after the invasion came. And then Suddenly, you're you're back in Iraq in a different position. Um, what was that experience like? Not obviously, there had been quite a few members of the U.S. Armed Forces who had been involved in the Gulf War who ended up later on back in Iraq. Right, but but not with the same experience you had in that battle, one of the few big battles of the first Gulf War. Um, how did you feel going back to Iraq? Yeah, it was it was interesting because um, in Desert Storm. Uh, I'll go back a little bit, if you don't mind, to West Point, teaching at West Point. So I went to West Point as a captain before Desert Storm. My next door neighbor happened to be a guy, we lived in a triplex actually, happened to be a guy by the name of Marty Dempsey, who you oh, probably know. That? So he, we were both captains together. Uh, we both went to Germany and deployed to Desert Storm. He was with the 3rd Armored Division. I was with the 1st Armored Division. We both came back and then in 2002, excuse me, 2003, uh, he was the division commander of the 1st Armored Division, and I was appointed as his assistant division commander. Mm -hmm. So we went back into combat again together. And what was fascinating, David, is Desert Storm was a conventional fight. It was one-on-one, -on -one, something we had always been trained to do against the Soviets in Europe. When going back to, to Baghdad in 2003 with the 1st Armored Division, it was really a complex counterinsurgency. Yeah. So from the standpoint of being a tanker, having fought in tank battles, we still had tanks in Baghdad, but truthfully, the majority of the fighting was being done by infantry, dismounted tankers, dismounted artillerymen, some artillerymen and, and the road and, and firing their weapons, 
But for the most part, it was street to street patrolling, uh, trying to find intelligence, going after insurgents. And the, the early days of, of Iraqi freedom in Baghdad, there was a combination of not only criminal activity of a lot of people that you know, didn't have jobs and were just trying to make money, but planting roadside bombs to, to make that money, insurgents, political malcontents, either Sunni or Shia, um, and a, an interesting dynamic, which I would learn a lot more about going back in 2007, which was the Kurdish element of Iraq. Uh, so it was just really a, a, a stew of different approaches to countering Americans or being with Americans. And there was a great number of, of criminals as well that were unemployed Iraqi males that were just trying to survive. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, it was a very different dynamic in 2003. And, and there was some other things that we, the United States made huge mistakes, like disbanding the Iraqi army, taking, taking away the retirement from all the retired generals and colonels and majors, mm -hmm. uh, using bath of debathifications as a means of destroying the, the population. And it really, in many cases worked against us. Yeah. It's one of those many areas of that experience from Operation Iraqi Freedom forward over the next at least 10 years of so much learning happened. Uh, so many people, so many words have been written, so many uh, thought, so much thought has been put into, you know, what did we learn about counterinsurgency? What did we learn about both preventing insurgency in the first place with some of those policies and should we have done them? But then did we learn enough quickly enough? Yeah. And people have studied it, you know, people will focus on the surge later on and, and efforts that were made to, to change the, the fundamental strategy. But people still question whether in those first couple of years, whether there was a quick enough learning curve. You, you were there. Obviously, pe people were thinking about it. These weren't people who had blinders on who were refusing to look at the circumstances on the ground, but right. it was truly a tough problem. What did, what did that part teach you about the the ability of the the military leadership um, all the way down in command, um, the ability to learn in, in a fast paced setting and whether people had the training to adapt on the ground quickly. Yeah, uh, we didn't uh, have the training to adapt on the ground. The, the better units adapted. Uh, what was interesting, I, I'll say, I'll, I'll again give kudos to my old boss and my best friend, Marty Dempsey. As the division commander, he got into the division about a month before I got there. They had already conducted their early attack into Iraq by under the command of another commanding general. Marty took over once they were inside of Baghdad. What was fascinating is I think he had the greatest insight into the mindset of the Iraqis of any of the other senior leaders that were there. And that's not because I'm biased and he's my best friend, but he had just come from a two year assignment in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so he, which he thought was the end of his career. And as you know, and I know, and many of your listeners know, he, he became the chairman of the joint chiefs, but he was sent to Saudi Arabia as a one star general and literally thought and told the chief of staff of the army, is this it for me? Because nobody goes to Saudi Arabia and comes out of that with a promotion. And the chief luckily told him, hey, you'll be OK. Well, he then commanded a division. So when he went in, he had a very good feel for Mideast culture, the Arab mind, uh, what we were fighting in terms of an insurgency. And in fact, he knew the language as well. So I think that gave us a great advantage. And, and I remember my first day reporting in where he had had his intelligence section, his G2, do a network diagram. And now this was 2003. Those were not prevalent in most army command posts that back then, as you know, yeah. uh, but he had a network diagram of all the cells that were inside of Baghdad. Hmm. And I looked at that and just, I was dumbfounded being an old tanker from spending most of my time in Germany. This hmm. was something completely new to me, but he had a pretty good feel for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so some units, some individuals adapted, some did not. Uh, there are great stories, as you know, of the of the some units that were just beating up on every civilian they could and were creating more enemies than they were right. eliminating. 
And that's, that's the problem. Even if you have pockets of, I don't know what to call it, pockets of excellence, um, you know, islands of adaptability that right. hopefully rise up together and become an archipelago of adaptability. Um, it doesn't take more than a few units who are doing it wrong to disrupt the effort that's going right. Right. Exactly. You know, it's interesting about that because I think, you know, I've commented on this. The, the Russian army does not seem to have anybody that mm. can get it right. Mm. Now, I don't know the details at the lower level, but at the mm. upper level, certainly people are rising into the ranks of general officers and colonels and continuously get it wrong. Mm. And we think that Ukraine is doing nothing but getting it right. Uh, and I know that's not the case uh, from people I've talked to, that there are some pockets of excellence, to use your term, and there are some pockets of you know, mediocrity within the Ukrainian army as well. Right. And we should not have this glorified vision of everybody doing it right on any battlefield, because any time you feel you're getting it completely right, you're going to be very quickly humbled. But there is something about a culture of training, about a culture of being willing to admit and then learn from mistakes, being willing to adopt um, doctrine in the traditional sense, but also training and command doctrine about the way in which we pursue objectives, that the Russian military is not known for that. I'll put it that right. way. Whereas the Ukrainians for years have, have been exposed to Western militaries and have had some of that creep in. Right. Um, to me, that says something, right? To me, that says that Ukrainian units, um, maybe inherently, but I, I think you, we, we can all try to pretend everything is inherent, but training matters and practice matters and culture matters. And to the extent that training with U.S. and other forces enabled the Ukrainian military to become better at that kind of thing, that there might be something to that. Yeah, well, what I'll share with you is my first two engagements with Ukraine's army were very negative. Uh, when we were, again, going back to the 2003, 2004 timeframe, when we were in Iraq, uh, we were just getting, our division was just getting ready to leave the country to redeploy back to Germany. And we were the first unit extended for an additional couple of months. Part of that extension was to go to the south of the country, south of Baghdad, and relieve the, the um, uh, the European Corps. I can't remember what they were called, but it was Spanish, Italian, Ukrainian, and I can't remember another, uh, maybe Portuguese troops. I can't remember. Mm. But my first step on a Ukrainian base in al -Qut province, it was disastrous. I mean, they had prostitutes in their barracks. They were drinking vodka. I mean, every element of discipline, soldier skills, they were actually selling ammunition to the enemy to make roadside bombs, those kind of things. My second experience with Ukraine was in 2004 or five when back mm -hmm. in Germany mm -hmm. and I visited uh, the, the K4 force in Kosovo. Yeah. And part of that force was a Ukrainian battalion. I talked to a German counterpart who was commanding there and he said they were the worst unit he had ever seen in his life. So, uh, you know, I didn't have a good feel for Ukraine until in 2008, uh, I visited and met later 2010, my counterpart, a guy named Colonel General Henedai Vorobyov, who uh, was a Ukrainian by birth, had served in the Soviet army, but then came back to Ukraine to be a National Guard commander. And he was brilliant and said his main purpose in life was to transform Ukraine's army into a Western style force. This was in 2010. Uh, and he asked for my help doing it. And that's when we set up the initial stages of the, of the training center in Yavoriv, Ukraine, outside of Lviv, where we started sending some Ukrainian officers to our war colleges, where we invited their soldiers to go to our NCO Academy down at Grafenbeer, Germany. Mm -hmm. So he had this vision of what the army should look like in 2010. And it's, it started to transform. And then, you know, even though the, the government still had significant corruption issues, he was able to drive the military into a much better place than it had been right. before. And right. we saw that starting in about 2014 when they opposed the Russian invasion of the Donbass and Crimea. Yeah. Uh, Mark, one of the things you've been able to bring to your um, almost daily analysis on CNN during this war 
has been insight into some of the issues like training and logistics, which to be fair, um, many other you know, military, senior military officers are able to bring to the conversation, but not all of them had your experiences. And as I recall, you were the first deputy commanding general for the initial military training back in, you're going to have to tell me, but somewhere around 2010, if I recall. 2009, yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's a really interesting thing. Talk a little bit about that, well, what it was, why it was new, and, and how that really helped you understand the dynamics you know, behind what you see? Because honestly, a lot of listeners um, and probably many more so viewers of cable news are, are thinking it's just tanks shooting at each other and not yeah. realizing everything that goes into what actually happens in the military conflict. Talk, talk us through that a little bit. How did the whole experience of training and especially that assignment prepare you to see the picture behind the picture? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll share three assignments, if you don't mind, that, that allow me to provide insight into what really goes on on the battlefield. The first, as you said, is, is commanding basic training, initial military training. So again, I'm going back to Marty Dempsey. I was in, uh, in Iraq in my third tour there as a division commander in northern Iraq, and Marty had been promoted to three-star. I was a two-star at the time, and he wanted to do a market walk with me in Mosul. So we, he came over to visit, he was at Central Command, came over and the two of us were doing our market walk and he said, hey, here's some inside information. He said, I think I'm going to be named uh, the commander of Training and Doctrine Command, TRADOC, uh, as I get my four star. And he said, when you come out of here, he said, I'm thinking of making you my new CG or Deputy Commanding General of Initial Military Training. And I said, what the hell's that? He goes, I don't know yet. I haven't started it, but you'd be the guy that runs it. He said, the reason I think we're looking at doing this is because I've made my initial, he said, I've made my initial rounds. We're having some problems inside of the army with soldier values and skills that are not meeting the demands on the battlefield. So I want you to take a look at all of our training centers uh, for basic training. And we had four basic training sites and 27 advanced training sites for soldiers who finish basic and then go on to be an intelligence analyst or a tanker or something like that. He said- That is a hard thing to get your hands around, much less to, to offer insight based on the analysis, but just to get your hands around that to analyze it is huge. Right. Well, and none of them were centralized. So the four basic training sites were at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Fort Knox, Kentucky, Fort Benning, Georgia, and what am I missing? I'm missing one more. They were all doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And there were no standards, as we talked about before, of mm -hmm. what to expect. So Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as an example, was spending three times the amount of time in uh, uh, combatives. Fort Benning was spending a lot of time on rifle marksmanship because they wanted to, to qualify all the infantrymen as experts. And you okay. can't do that. You might you literally have to depend on the first unit of assignment to do some of these training things. Mm -hmm. So we we took a look at, at leveling out all the things, redoing the skills that we were expecting of the soldiers. We called them warrior task and drills, uh, looking at the challenges we had with the youth of America in terms of their fitness level, which was not very good, still is not very good, as well as the training inculcation of values. You know, because to be a soldier, you have to have a set of professional values that guide you in difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was one thing I learned a lot in those two years. But David, truthfully, the, <laughs> the two years where I think I got what might be considered a PhD on, on the battlefield was my time at the National Training Center in the middle of California. And for your mm -hmm. listeners, that's a place where Units go for a brigade unit goes for a period of a month and they literally fight a battle for two weeks of that month. And every 24 to 48 hours, the battle is stopped. Everybody is pulled together. You conduct an after action review, say, here's what you did right. Here's what you did wrong. Now go back out and do it again. And really what you do is you kind of pick some scabs and tell people how poorly they are performing so you can improve their performance level as a combat unit. Um, you know, commanders would come into that place thinking that their unit was absolutely terrific and they could do no wrong. And as someone once said, their shiza couldn't stink, uh, to use the German expression. 
But what they would soon find is when you had a bunch of people looking at you from all different kinds of directions and you had cameras and devices like like uh, laser tag uh, that showed who was getting shot and who wasn't. And you had films of when people were moving places and you had the real reasons why you couldn't shoot because you didn't resupply your batteries the night before or you know, the real reason the unit didn't start at six o'clock in the morning was because they were still in their sleeping bag. And oh, by the way, here's the film of them still sleeping when you thought they were taking off to attack the enemy. So when you're presented with that kind of evidence as a commander, you know, when you've got an organization of 9,000 soldiers, there are going to be a lot of people doing things wrong, even though you're saying everybody's doing things right. Uh, so that year long period of being the commander of that organization that mm -hmm. portrayed the scenarios and designed uh, the pitch battles and watched the other units come through. And then I repeated that again in Germany, uh, commanding uh, writ large, the big training center, which was just not the field training, but it was also the simulations and the gunnery training and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell you every day, if you think you can be surprised by anything as an old 50 or 60 year old general, you would be surprised at all the new surprises you get. Uh, and, and that's why when people say things are going to work perfectly on the battlefield, they just don't know how the Clausewitzian phrase of fog and friction yeah. and coup de oie and all those French terms come into play. I would venture a guess that the Russians do not have an equivalent to what you just described. Not. That 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 culture of bringing commanders, senior commanders in and saying, Hey, look, um, we're going to show you just how much you don't know, and then you're going to do it again, and then we'll show you how much you didn't learn, and then we're going to show you again until you learn. That just seems like a different culture entirely. It is, and that's what I saw. When, every time I went to Russia, and I've been there about four times, what I saw was not – they said they were taking me to a training event, but what it was was a very – rehearsed demonstration of tanks going into the water with their snorkel tubes and artillery firing just in time. And all of it was according to a time schedule, but time schedules don't work in real war. Yeah, that seems more akin to a, a military parade in the streets of Pyongyang than it does to actual battle conditions. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't, I'm not going to say this in order to gloss over your other military career highlights, but there's so much other interesting stuff to talk about as well. Um, frankly, I would have enjoyed reading a book that you wrote about your experience at the Battle of Medina Ridge or <laughs> reading a book about the the culture of training and how it evolved during your time from the early 1970s to you know 30 plus years later. Um, but that's not the book you wrote. You, you <laughs> after retirement, <laughs> ended up working with the uh, Florida Hospital Organization and translated some of your experiences into a book specifically focused at leaders in healthcare, trying to grow physician leaders. How did that come about? Well, I was recruited uh, as I was retiring to come to, to Florida Hospital, which is now Advent Health, to develop a program they called Global Partnering. That was what I was hired to do. And in about my third or fourth month working there, my next door neighbor in the office was the chief medical officer. Uh, and he would come in every once in a while and tell me a problem he was having with physician behavior or physician mm -hmm. training or something. And he'd mm -hmm. say, Mark, what would you do about this in the army? And it was a training problem uh, and a leadership problem most of the time. And we would have these in-depth discussions over a cup of coffee or two. And he said, you know, we tried to put together a leadership program for our doctors. And it never worked because we would always hire either consultants or contractors and they'd come in and they'd, they'd use a business approach with doctors of management and leadership, but that doesn't work in healthcare. And he says, our doctors shunned them. And he said, maybe having a general here talking about leadership might work. Could you put together a leadership program for these guys? So again, I'd only been there about four months and I said, hey, let me get a little bit more better feel for the culture before I try this. Uh, I did an analysis over a month, came back to him with a very simplistic program. And in fact, truthfully, and this is a deep, dark secret, don't tell anybody. The thing we started teaching doctors are the same things we teach newly promoted sergeants. 
Uh, and the reason it, it resonated is because doctors spend a great deal of time on the science of medicine, but they don't spend any time on the art of leadership in their, in their training. So our desire was to give them this initial dunking in the basics of leadership over a six month period of time. And what we saw in that first course that I taught, and it was a six month course, but it was only taught one day a month for a five hour seminar. So it was, it was only, you know, 30 hours worth of training, but it was with 50 doctors, uh, actually 35 doctors, 10 nurses and five administrators were in each class because we wanted a teaming effect. Uh, just like you do in the military, uh, where you don't just put all the tankers in the room. You got to bring in the infantry, the artillery, the logisticians in order to get that teaming effect. So what we saw in these in these seminars was a real breakdown of the understanding of leadership, uh, how your attributes and competencies contribute, how your approach to influencing others, both up, down and sideways is critical, how the context matters in terms of your situation. And after the first course, what we saw in these 50 people that went through was uh, truly transformational in terms of the way they approached their patients, their, their patients' families, the other physicians, the administrators. They had a better understanding of each other. And in fact, the, the chief medical officer termed it catastrophic success in this course. So we continued on with it. Uh, did it another year, doubled the size of the courses, increased the number of people that were going. Mm -hmm. And in the third year, they said, could you write a book about this that we can use and do it in six months? So that's where I put together this, this growing physician leaders book, which truthfully, I mean, surprised me being a military guy, not a doctor. Um, it sort of became a niche bestseller in the, in the healthcare market, uh, which is kind of fun. There, there was a market that needed it. Uh, did, did you find what I would suspect here? Because there, there are definitely some professions where people who are highly skilled, highly educated, and and generally, you know, at the best of even that, um, how do I say this politely? Uh, ego tends to be a partner yeah. uh, in, in that enterprise. Uh, people are told how good they are, and they actually are very important for some very important reasons. And there seems to be a correlation with that level of ego building um, and people who think they don't need leadership training because obviously they've been successful at everything they've done to this point. Did, did you have some unlearning to do there? Did you have to teach them to get rid of some of that ego in order yeah. to be a good leader? Yeah, that was actually part of seminar two. Uh, you know, understanding humility is a critical element of any professional. Um, there's a great book uh, written during the interwar years called generalship, it's diseases and it's cures. Uh, and one of the facets of that book is to tell generals, don't get caught up with yourself. Don't think uh, you can do everything perfectly. And you've got to always have that corporal by your side to tell you what you're screwing up. The same applies to doctors in healthcare. And that's one of the things we talk about because as you just said, they are trained to be the smartest person in the room. They are trained to know that they put their hands inside of people's bodies, which is a godlike thing to do, and suddenly bring back life where death was occurring. So that's a pretty heady thing to do. Uh, so yeah, ego is a big uh, thing in many physicians, not all, but it's something that if you just remind them, hey, humility is kind of important too yeah. uh, in leaders, uh, try and concentrate on formulating that a little bit in your, in your style of leadership. And there's a, a similar, um, but a, a different flavor of a challenge, I would think with, with generals, which is, as you said, you know, generalship uh, diseases, uh, and cures, um, at least in the public conception, who, who are some of the most celebrated generals who are seen as, uh, exemplars of leadership? Sometimes these are people sometimes like Patton's or MacArthur's or people who, they're, that's not really what you're talking about when you're talking about leadership yeah. and letting go of ego. Um, humility doesn't come to mind when you talk about some of the most publicly celebrated generals of olden days. 
So I, I think you've got to unwrap some of those preconceived notions, not just in the physician realm, but also when you're you're training senior military officers as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, my uh, my hero from a military. People always ask, "Who's your favorite general?" And, and I think there were a couple. One is is uh, Marshall, uh, yeah. who was probably the most mm -hmm. humble guy you can imagine if you've read anything about him. And, and the other guy who doesn't get his credit due is is, is Pershing in World War One. Uh, you know, a guy that transformed an army. You know, went from twenty seven thousand to two million soldiers in France, and and uh, did some great things. But yeah. doesn't, you know, and, and oh, by the way, that entire time he was leading in Mexico and in, in, in Europe, his, his entire family had just been killed in a, in a house fire in San Francisco. Uh, yeah. But he put his head down and continued on. So, yeah. you know, the, the people that see the, the, the movie Patton and only see that one snippet of time when he was a battlefield general and think he's the greatest that ever lived, you know, they ought to explore the rest of his life and see what he did in the against the bonus marchers in the 1930s and right. the historical element right. of how he wasn't really well liked by his colleagues either. Yeah. You mentioned uh, General John Pershing, and he's a great link to what I do want to focus on a lot here. We're going back at the time we're recording this. It's not yet the 100th anniversary, but by the mm. time people hear this, we will have just passed the 100th anniversary of the creation of the American Battle Monuments Commission. And General Pershing had a big big role in that. So let's set the stage. Um, when people think about battle monuments and uh, cemeteries overseas for Americans who have fallen in duty, um, that that really wasn't an organized thing before General Pershing. So what was the situation for some of the U.S. conflicts that involved soldiers you know, dying outside of the United States and then what happened in the aftermath of the First World War that changed that? Yeah, I am so happy you're asking that question, David, because this is something that truthfully I've just recently learned since being a part of uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission, or ABMC as we call it. Um, it World War I was the first time America had fought outside of its national boundaries and sustained significant injuries and deaths. Yeah, there's the key there, right? I yeah, mean, that's we've the all key. learned about the the, um, the the battles overseas in previous wars, like you mentioned, you know, Spanish American War or Mexican American War, but it was the the sheer amount of the dead compared yeah. to previous conflicts. Well and we had never done that before. Uh, so there were over a hundred thousand dead, US dead in World War One. And they were temporarily interred on European soil um, and with, with the full intent, as we've always done in the past, to return them home uh, to private cemeteries or national cemeteries or whatever. But the logistics challenge, again, logistics comes into play. Uh, a couple of years later, as you're uh, you know, taking these interred remains and hopefully trying to ship them back, the question becomes, it would literally take decades to do that, given the science of the day. So uh, Pershing at the time was chief of staff of the Army. There was a board that the Congress of the United States established called the, the Battle Monuments Board, initially to address just monuments that were being placed, like the statues and things to different people. Because if you're ever with a military unit and soldiers come out of a battle, you know the first thing they're going to want to do is build a monument to themselves. Yep. Well, because we had hundreds of thousands of soldiers still in France and they had nothing to do while they were waiting for the troop ships to bring them back home, they started putting monuments up to themselves all over the French countryside and the French government was not too happy with that. <laughs> so the government, the U.S. government, Congress said, let's address this by determining a board that board then expanded to the, the problem set of what do we do with all these interred bodies that we have all over the European continent. Um, Pershing took charge. Congress, after much debate, uh, decided that they would give family members the choice of bringing home their, their sacrificed soldier uh, and either uh, burying them in a private plot a national cemetery somewhere in the United States, or leaving them in Europe. And about, I think, I, I may be wrong in this, I think about 60% said, leave them in Europe. 60% yeah. of families said, leave them where they fell. 
Mm -hmm. So then there was a requirement to uh, put together these cemeteries uh, versus just the places of internment. And Pershing retired from the military, was the perfect guy to say, you're in charge of this. You're the, now the chairman of this commission. Hmm. And we want you to determine where these cemeteries should go and what monuments should actually be built or, hmm. or retained. Yeah. At the end of World War I, there were nine cemeteries across Europe, uh, 15 monuments, a uh, hmm. total of, I think, uh, and this is off the top of my head, I want to say 35,000 uh, soldiers remain buried in those nine cemeteries. Wow. So it, it's just a fascinating story. Right. And of course, Pershing wanted these things to be the most beautiful places in the world to honor his, his dead soldiers who had fought under him. That's right. uh, so he put a great deal of his effort into it. Now, he was, by the way, he was the chairman of the commission <laughs> from 1923 when it was established until 1948. It's a remarkable legacy that many people don't even know about because his accomplishments up to that point get so much attention that it's amazing that he everything that has come since is due in some way to the leadership of General Pershing. Right. And they kept them on board uh, during World War II when they realized, hey, there's another couple of hundred thousand dead yes. from our World War II exploits. Uh, yeah. So we've either got to expand these cemeteries or build new ones. So in World War II, they plotted out 14 more cemeteries in right. different countries throughout Europe, not just in France. Something uh, that surprised me when uh, when earlier we, we talked about this, you told me that the original commission well, it was a remarkably constructed thing um, to hit every constituency. So, of course, it had John Pershing, and you're not going to get better than that. But, of course, there was also an active duty Army officer involved, but then a senator and a member of Congress and representatives from veteran service organizations, uh, a mother of a, of a deceased soldier. Yeah. Um, that is quite a group to come together to address something that none of them had individually trained for before. Yeah. But suddenly to start making decisions about the design of monuments and and how to interact with the the host governments, if you will, what to do with cemeteries and land and how to commemorate and memorialize. The, these are issues that none of them had graduate degrees in, and yet they found a way to come together and lay the foundation for what you're doing now. You're following in those footsteps, um, helping you know lead this commission now. Um that legacy is, of course, much bigger now because, as you mentioned, there was the Second World War, but many others. What's the scale of the Battle, Battle Monuments Commission now in terms of number of facilities, um, number of fallen uh, service members, et cetera? Yeah, there are uh, right now we oversee 32 memorials. And these memorials, if you were to see them, and I'd, I'd suggest any of your listeners Google U.S. American Battle Monuments uh, uh, Committee and it, Commission, I'm sorry, and it will show you the memorials. And they are all these unbelievably beautiful, uh, very large memorials outside of the United States, with the exception of two, where there's an East Coast Memorial and a West mm. Coast Memorial, one in New York mm. Harbor and one in uh, right near the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is the West Coast Memorial. Mm -hmm. There are 26 cemeteries. Uh, with a total of about, uh, um, oh gosh, 125,000 U.S. war dead in those, yeah. in those uh, 32, uh, excuse me, 26 cemeteries. We are also documenting 94,000 missing in action uh, in those sites. Uh, and tell both. me, how, how are those documented? Because there's, there's no right answer about how to treat that. And there's been much controversy over decades about the best way to do that. What is what is the standard practice now for doing it? Yeah, you're talking specifically the missing in action. Yes, I am. Well, all the missing in actions are on the walls of our very. We, each cemetery has a wall, and they have missing in action. When a missing of action in action is found, and in fact, we had one two weeks ago from World War II. The the remains were found on a French countryside. Uh, they put a rosette next to the individual's name. They invite we invite the family members who are still living back to the cemetery and literally place a small rosette uh, on that uh, wall of the missing. 
So as you go around to these 26 cemeteries, David, and I would highly recommend to any of your listeners to do that for a, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're all over the world. Uh, the sun never sets on ABMC cemeteries. So what I'd tell you is I'm, I'll name where they are. Midway Island, Mexico, Panama, Cuba, uh, Morocco, France, the United States uh, has the two memorials. Um, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Italy has two cemeteries. France has has uh, six. Belgium has six. Uh, New Zealand, the Solomon Islands, the Philippines, New Guinea, South Korea has a monument. So you can see that the sun never sets. They're on five different continents. Um, but in each one of these places, and, and again, I will admit that I am biased. <laughs> they are not only extremely well cared for, mm -hmm. um, but they have architecture and artwork in these cemeteries that, that an art student would be amazed with, um, mm -hmm. The cemetery grounds, and I could go on and on. You're going to have to stop me about this. Well, no, because I've got 17,000 follow-on questions. Okay. They, they are pristine. Now, The one that's burning me is you said that these facilities and the way you've described them is amazing. And honestly, there are many people who have seen them, perhaps without thinking of the commission behind it. Right. I'm thinking most here about the Normandy American Cemetery yep. and the uh, Ranger Monument um, right there. Um, but obviously, many of these well known uh, relatively, but many of them very much lesser known. Yeah. You mentioned that they are meticulously cared for, yeah. and that's a very passive construction. Who does the caring for all of these facilities? Uh, that's a great question. We, we have uh, cemetery superintendents, and most of them, not all, are former military. Um, they have sometimes a small staff of United States uh, federal workers, small staff, but the majority of people who care for the cemeteries itself are the locals. And uh, on the 4th of March, I'm going to do a, a advertisement for you, if you don't mind me hitting this. Mm -hmm. We are going to unveil a film uh, at the National, the U.S. National Gallery in Washington, D.C. It's a 56-minute mm -hmm. film. I was able to watch it as a preview. I was one of a couple of people that had the chance to preview it. And it was an entire box of tissues for me. Yes. Because it it tells the story of the cemeteries, but mostly it tells the stories of the workers hmm. and the people around the cemetery and how they are generations. Uh, there's this one gardener at the Netherlands Cemetery whose father was a gardener and his grandfather was a gardener, right. uh, the chief gardener. And uh, in some of the cemeteries, most of the cemetery, the local population adopts the graves um, uh, there, there is such pristine care of the grounds. First of all, the grass looks like a, a greens on a golf course, but the grounds are so meticulously, uh, cared for in terms of their trees, the types of plants they use. Yeah. Um, our, our cemetery in the Philippines, uh, was right outside Mount Pinatabo when it, when the, it erupted a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there was about two and a half feet of ash, volcanic ash over all the, the, the 8,000 graves that are there. It is, if you were to go there today, it looks like the fairway at Augusta. Uh, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, each one of the cemeteries has uh, uh, artwork uh, specific to that part of the world mm -hmm. that I've learned, you know, I'm not an art major or anything like that, but I've learned so much for why different pieces of art were established in these cemeteries alongside all the, the graves. Um, if I can, David, I, I know you have a lot of questions, but I want to tell you one story, if you don't mind, because it's, it's Please. my wife and I, our favorite memory of living in Europe. Uh, Christmas Eve 2011, we were invited by our garrison commander, uh, uh, to come up and attend midnight mass on Christmas Eve in, in uh, the Netherlands. So he said, hey, I want to show you this Christmas Eve. It's in a cave. Uh, this mass is held in a cave. It's, uh, it's held by the De Chark Monastery, but they have a, a, a limestone quarry that's a cave nearby, and that's where they hold the mass. And he says, I'll tell you more about it when you get here. 
So we drove up, they, they told us what hotel to stay in. We stayed there. And while we're at the hotel, we see the little pamphlet in the hotel lobby that says Margraten Cemetery, or what is more appropriately named, named the Netherlands American Cemetery in Margraten, was about five miles down the road. Christmas Eve, David, the wind is blowing sideways, rain, horrible day. My wife says to me, before we go to midnight mass, let's go out to the cemetery yeah. and just pay our respect, yeah. thinking no one would be there. We get out there, and I think uh, the number buried there is between seven and 8,000. I don't know the exact number. Uh, seven to 8,000 Americans are buried in this plot of land. We get out there. The parking lot is completely packed with cars. There are literally hundreds of people, all Dutch citizens, going through caring for the grave markers, hmm. planting flowers. Wow. Um, and what we found out is not only are they doing this, but these are grave sites that they've adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to one family that had two twin boys and they had two graves. They had a one with a Roman cross and the other one with the Star of David. And we asked them why they were doing this. And they said, well, we've had these two graves in our family since the war uh, that we've adopted it. And they have a society in the town that does this. And she said, it will go to our children as part of our heritage, but it's to teach them what liberty and freedom is all about yeah. and how you have to sacrifice. We go to the, to the mass that night, and I'm sorry for extending this story, but we go to the mass that night. And what had happened in this cave in uh, December of 1944 is the people of the town, about 200 people were on one side, 200 soldiers were on the other side that had just been told they were going up to a place called Bastogne the next morning on Christmas day. And on the wall of this small chapel, underground chapel was uh, a large limestone block. And every one of the soldiers who were there that night signed their name. And about 97% of them never came back. Oh. Wow. That's, that's remarkable. That's a, what a day. I mean, that's a lot of emotion to process in one day for anyone, but yeah. especially given your role at the time. Hundreds of stories like that. I mean, thousands of stories like that yeah. for each one of these people. So the the, the, the facilities, uh, I don't know what else to call them, uh, because they, they, they range here, right? There's cemeteries, but there's also battle monuments right. that, that do not have remains there. But the range of these, I think it's understandable to most people that France will will have many. Right. Um, and the Netherlands and perhaps, you know, the Solomon Islands makes sense. I thought I heard you mention New Zealand. Yeah. And I don't recall a lot of um, hostile U.S. military action uh, on the ground in New Zealand. So describe facilities like that, the ones perhaps in the countries that people don't think of as much as having a, a yeah. strong U.S. military presence, either monuments or cemeteries, yeah, and, and, and what you make of those and why it's important for us to see those as well. Well, New Zealand, interestingly enough, I just talked to someone who had visited. It's a monument. It is not a cemetery. So it is one of the monuments, as you just said, mm -hmm. uh, but it is uh, uh, a multi-country uh, monument that has different countries who had all contributed to that campaign campaign. Uh, in the New Zealand area, the Philippines, New Guinea, yeah. uh, in the South Pacific, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a memorial to the missing because of naval battles that were in that area. Uh, but it's also uh, something that's, that's basically uh, upheld by our U.S. ambassador in uh, New Zealand, but also with the, with the great support of the New Zealand government. Uh, there's another one we're celebrating in just a couple of weeks at Gibraltar. Uh, there is a naval monument uh, for the Battle of Gibraltar. Oh. It's, you know, it's, we're, I, I'm not sure we're going to send anybody there because it's so difficult to get there, but the U.S. Uh, naval Forces Europe commander is going to go there mm. uh, because it is literally right on the rock, and uh, it's, it's one, of our, one of our monuments. Yeah. What's the, be, until that one comes up aboard, what's, what's the newest site? Wasn't there a memorial cemetery near Paris that a few years ago, I remember hearing was, was yeah. added, maybe the French government yeah. thought yeah. added, and then now it's uh, under the control of the Battle Monuments Commission? Yeah, that's the Lafayette Escadrille Memorial. That's uh, it. And I was actually there last Memorial Day. Uh, the French government uh, asked us to take, take it over uh, about five or six years ago. 
it is a tribute to all of the fighter pilots from the United States that formed the Lafayette Escadrille uh, that was a French unit uh, commanded by French commanders, but it had American pilots who wanted to fight for France before the U.S. got into World War I. Uh, it is in the middle of a park, a beautiful park. It's an absolutely gorgeous monument. It's on our website too. But what's fascinating in the, uh, the underground part of the monument, you can, you can visit this, the sarcophagus of the monument, there are the, the 39 caskets of American soldiers, American aviators, who all died flying for the, under the French flag for the Lafayette Escadrille. Interesting dynamic since we're in Black History Month. Uh, a sad story uh, having to do with that. There was one black aviator who, because of the uh, racism at the time of World War I was not accepted into a, a U.S. black aviator who learned how to fly, uh, uh, went into, uh, uh, volunteered to be in the Lafayette Escadrille. They turned him down. So the French said, well, if the Americans don't want you to fly with them, you can fly with us. So he flew with the French uh, and later on went back to, I think, Nashville, Tennessee, a great story about that is when President de Gaulle came to visit President Kennedy uh, in Washington in the 1960s, he brought to his attention the story of this aviator who was the first black aviator, first black combat power pilot, shot down two German planes, and he was an elevator operator in Nashville in 1960, and it's the only person that Charles de Gaulle wanted to meet and present with the Croix de Guerre when he came to the United States. Remarkable. You did mention the uh, facility that was transferred from the French government uh, to to the United States. That raises the question for me, how many others like that are there, whether they are small, if you will, personal plots or small memorials that somehow have not yet become part of the Battle Monuments Commission? Are there a handful, dozens, hundreds. Thousands. What else is out there around the world, perhaps primarily in Europe, but not exclusively, that that are still memorializations of American sacrifices during conflicts that at least now are not yet under the Battle Monuments Commission? Yeah, I, there are literally thousands and we have a list of them. Uh, they are not under the, the guys we have, as I said, 32. And, and General Pershing's desire was to have these mo memorials, the, the monuments, be to big battles. So it wasn't, hey, the first squad of 2nd Platoon did this at this location. And there are literally hundreds of those kinds too. Um, but these were supposed to be big uh, Army Corps level or above, uh, which is what our 32 memorials are. We are currently in, in negotiations, truthfully, with the, the government of Belgium, uh, with the King of Belgium, on a monument called Martisan, which is mm -hmm. in Bastogne. Uh, this was a monument the, 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 the Belgians built within a year of the end of World War uh, II by taking bricks from all their damaged houses and building a memorial to the American soldiers that had liberated Bastogne. Uh, 70 years later, as you can imagine, it's falling down and not in good shape. So the government of Belgium has asked us uh, to take it over and repair it. <laughs> but the price is pretty steep, as you can imagine. So we're in negotiations right now trying to get some money from Congress to help us do that. And that raises another question I had about how all of this happens. Uh, because the, the, the commission is not huge. There's what, a few, few hundred workers. There's the commissioners appointed by the president and including your, yourself. Um, but in the descriptions of all this, all that you've done in terms of an ask is that when people are traveling overseas, that they try to take the time to visit these because they are so remarkable, both nationally and personally for, for the experience of going there. You, you haven't asked for donations. Um, no. You haven't said lobby your representatives for this. How does, how does the commission do its work and what is it that people can do to assist this effort of memorialization if they find it important to do so? Well, we don't ask for donations. And in fact, if we couldn't accept them if someone tried to give them. Uh, we do have uh, a partner foundation, the American Battle Monuments Foundation, which is a 501c3 uh, in New York City 
uh, that actually supports us with quite a few things. Uh, so as an example, they'll, they'll support us with some scholarships. Uh, they support us with receptions uh, at different locations on Memorial Day where, you know, they bring in some sh- champagne to, you know, help us with the locals and things like that. But it's a great organization of a relatively small number of people. And if someone is interested, they can look at uh, American Battle Monuments Foundation, ABMF, and see where they might contribute. But I, truthfully, I'm ethically and legally bound not to give that too much publicity. Right. Um, but truthfully, the only thing we want, David, is for people to visit the sites and to learn our history. The thing about ABMC sites, and you mentioned it so well, uh, after the wars, it, it was a grieving organization. Uh, in fact, after World War II, uh, the Queen Mary, the, 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 the British government allowed us to use the ship, the Queen Mary, to, to bring grieving widows to Europe mm. to visit the battlefields and the cemeteries. Yeah. Uh, we don't have that anymore. We don't have any you know, cemeteries overseas from Iraq or Afghanistan or even Vietnam, mm. uh, other than maybe the, the, the Vietnam Wall at, at, in, in Pearl Harbor, not, not just the one in, New, in Washington, but in Pearl Harbor. So what we're turning into, what we're transforming from is a grieving organization to an educational organization. And we want the youth of countries, uh, not just the ones where our cemeteries are, which seem to have a better feel for sacrifice than sometimes the Americans do. We want to do more things for the American public to help them understand what ABMC is and does. Mm -hmm. And if they can, during their trips to Europe or on their cruise to uh, the Mediterranean, stop off at a couple of our cemeteries in Southern France or in Italy and see the beauty and and hear the story. Because once you go to one of our sites, you will come away different. Mm. Uh, The the emotional and spiritual effect that these sites have on people who visit is just off the charts. That's all I can say. You know, early on in this podcast, I spoke with uh, Professor Marita Sturkin, who does a lot of work on memorialization, specifically in the museums and monuments context. And we spent a lot of time talking about the, the difficulty of getting people to agree on what stories to tell, how to memorialize. In her case, She focused a lot on the 9-11 memorials and museums in New York, Washington, and around the country, as well as the the issues uh, around the Pentagon and others. And just the debates about how are you going to represent bodies that aren't there? Or where do you put the names of the deceased? And do you tell the full story of what led up to the conflict, even if it sometimes doesn't shed an entirely positive light on how this thing came about? And I'm wondering if that is, if that has tripped you up in any ways, looking at the battle monuments and the ideas for bringing new ones in under the commission, have there been any controversies or at least some interesting discussions about how we show things and does the artwork, which you've described as being unique to each facility, um, is that artwork appropriate for the overall mission that we're talking about? Yeah, I think one of the things we always have to remember, and it's what we do, is separate the war from the warriors. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's all kinds of politics and mistakes and decision making that goes into sending America's youth to war. Uh, but that should not detract at all from the service and the sacrifice of those who give their lives for their country and being asked to do what they do. Uh, You know, you can question whether or not we should have done this or that in any particular war. But, you know, soldiers don't get a choice. When they're told to go somewhere, they go there and they fight where they're sent. And if need be, they die for what they're fighting for. Um, There are some, there are some very sad stories. Um, I'll, I'll tell one very quickly if I can. I was in the Seren Cemetery, which is outside of Paris. If you're in Paris, you should go to Seren, the American cemetery. It overlooks in the distance the Eiffel Tower. Right in front of it is the American hospital that was there in World War II, or excuse me, World War I. Um, But I was walking the cemetery with the superintendent, 
and I saw two women's names uh, side by side. And I said, and they both had Croix de Guerre on the tombstone and Army Nurse Corps from World War I. And I said, hey, tell me the story of, you know, the Caldwell sisters here, because they both had the same birth date and the same death date. I said, were they, and the death date was January of 2019. So it was a year after the war ended. And he said, well, this is actually kind of a sad story. He said, these two sisters were um, uh, from high society in New York. And when the war started, they decided to join the nurse corps, the uh, American Red Cross nurse corps, and volunteer to go to France. And they were two debutantes from New York. In fact, their their uncle was the head of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and they went and saw for the first six months they were there, were in the midst of battles. And there were pictures of them taking care of soldiers, constant artillery, under constant artillery, much like Ukraine is today. Um, and one of their doctors said after six months that they seem to be suffering from Malay, what we would call today PTSD. Uh, at the time, they used to call it a soldier's heart. So it was an emotional, they thought it had something yeah. to do with the cardiac uh, right. system, but they didn't know it was a mental illness or a mental debilitation, not illness. So the, the doctor who was in charge of them sent them back from the front lines at Chateau Terry to Paris to work in the hospital in Paris. What was happening at the end of 1918? The Spanish flu. So they went from the battlefield to the pandemic ward and saw more death and destruction, just like we've seen in yeah. COVID. Right. Uh, hmm. The war is over. They're waiting to go back to New York. They get on a troop ship that binds them back. They're, before they leave, they're given a letter from their uncle saying, when you come back to New York, don't bring any of the battlefield with you. We don't want to hear anything about this courage and sacrifice. We just want you to come back to be a part of our family again. Hmm. So these two sisters, having suffered post-traumatic stress, realized that they had been fighting for something that a lot of their family did not believe in, uh, decided they didn't want to go back to, the, to New York. So they climbed on the front of the ship that was taking them home and both jumped off and committed suicide. Oh. But the French government said that they would bury them on French soil and that they're at the American cemetery. Um, and uh, they were both given the Croix de Guerre after the war. And the way you tell that story certainly implies that you could go to many, many of these facilities and encounter story after yep. story that are that are moving in ways like this. They're, they're at, at the Seren Cemetery, where the two Caldwell sisters are buried, uh, three plots away from them is the site of the guy who was in the, fir the first death from a tank battle in World War I, uh, because that was the first time tanks were used. Right. And he's buried right there, three down from them. So, and what we're doing now at all these sites, David, is we're, we're not, we not only have the markers, but all the site superintendents are now trying to find actual pictures and put a stand next to the site with the picture and a small story uh, to make it a, a more of a living men, uh, monument as opposed to just a, a grave marker. Right. Well, uh, you mentioned already that by the time uh, people are listening to this, there will be a video out from the ABMC. Will that will that be available on the website as well as at the museum? It, it will. It, it will be live streamed on uh, Twitter and Facebook on the 4th at 7 o'clock. Uh, I'll post it on my Twitter feed for sure, uh, Mar at Mark Hurtling. Um, okay. But I'm sure it will be on the website within days. But it's, okay. it's an absolutely we'll sure beautiful point, film. We'll make sure to point people to that website uh, so they can see it. Um, this has been a remarkable tour of the, the the monuments and cemeteries that many people don't know exist or have somehow forgotten about. But this is a good opportunity to remind people to visit them when they when they do get the chance. But we'll close out our conversation by reaching into our vaunted chatterbox <laughs> and see what fate has in store. I've for heard you. about this. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, if you could give one piece of advice to your 20 year old self, what would it be? Never have a bad day. Huh. What do you mean by that? 
what I mean by that is there will be some things that will depress you and, and bring you down. Uh, but if you're going to be a leader, you always have to have kind of an upbeat demeanor. Uh, and that's not saying repress your anxieties or fears or anything like that. I'm just saying that part of being a leader is somewhat theatrical in nature, that you have to portray to others that you're always upbeat, uh, unless you're sometimes portraying why you're, you're down or sad, as I did at visiting a couple of these cemeteries and seeing these sites. But just uh, take your time, realize that everyone is good inside somewhere, and we should try and find that good. And at the same time, uh, we should never try and have bad days in front of other people. What a remarkable way to end this conversation. Uh, Mark Hurtling, thanks for taking the time and sharing your own history, as well as the history of, of so many others who made the ultimate sacrifice for this country and your efforts on the American Battle Monument Commission honoring their sacrifices. Thank you. You're very welcome, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Thank you.